yes, I am Ade Shokumbi. Um, as the introduction stated, uh, I'm an architect first and foremost. But uh, over the years, I've sort of like found myself more leaning towards being a, a builder. And not just a contractor, but a builder because, you know, I try and put passion and a little bit of an understanding into what it is that we build. So um, I came back to Nigeria from the UK back in 2006, yeah, thereabouts. Um, and when I came back, just before I actually moved back, um, in the UK I had started doing a lot of designing and building. So that kind of like initiated me into this whole journey that I've ended up finding myself on. Um, and so when I moved back, I think I actually was invited to come and design um, a crepe shop, a crepe shop, like a pancake shop. And this was at the time that they had just built the, the palms, the mall that everybody calls ShopRite, but anyway, it's called the Palms. And um, so that brought me into Nigeria. And when I came, it was strictly to just do the design work. But um, when I came to oversee what people were going to do based on my concept and my design, I just said to the guys who had invited me that, listen, this has to stop. Because I remember the first day that I got to the mall and they had invited the guy who was going to execute the work. And he came in like his, uh, what do they call, furniture. So he came in like a plastic bag. And all he had in it was a hammer and a very rusty saw. And I'm like, is this the guy that's going to turn my beautiful concept into what it is meant to be? Um, and I was like, nah, guys, don't worry about this. I'll take this. So that basically initiated me into trying to do stuff out here in Lagos. And then from there on, it led to a few more projects. I guess people saw what I was capable of doing. And that led to, um, yes. So that led to um, a few projects that don't necessarily need to be discussed at this point. But um, um, I think in about 2009, um, I was asked to look at a project that had already, basically it was a plot in Lecky phase one. And then let me just even give you a slight background into this. When I first moved back, I think it was during the time that a lot of people used to work in, you know, the banking industry and lived on the mainland. And obviously trying to get to work was a bit of a, a challenge. So they were like renting BQs in houses in Lecky, you know, like a one bedroom unit or something like that. And that kind of like made me think that uh, things can be, certainly things can be much different. So the opportunity now came to develop some kind of lifestyle or some kind of, I mean, some way of living for young people that only needed like a small space. So um, a friend of mine now got me to look at uh, a development where he had bought a plot of land in Lecky Phase 1 that already had two um, what you call DPC level foundation or foundation. There were two units or two foundations on that plot and he wanted to do something with it and I was like, okay, you know what? Since I've been thinking about the shortage of accommodation for young people, why don't we just do like a one bed studio or apartment or whatever. So that led to a, a concept that, sorry. Oh, sorry, I mean, I wanted to first of all talk about what a concept is, that, and that's why I actually asked the question that who are the architects here, and there are only a few, but they're architectural students. So I, I'm taking it that you all know what a concept is and what a concept can be and how a concept can actually start, what can trigger off a concept. Um, so, I mean, this actually says an abstract idea, plan of intention, 
or a plan or intention, an idea or invention to help sell or publicize a commodity. So um, based on the little sort of like premise or So what I mean, what are the approaches to design generally? As in, not necessarily wanting to give like a lecture here about you know design or concept particularly. I really wanted to talk about what our own sort of like intervention with all these ideas are. And like I was saying earlier about the concept that came out of this notion that young people didn't have anywhere to stay. So we now created, or I created this little um, design, you know, which basically consists of, like I was saying, it had two existing foundations on the plot. So this consists of six one-bedroom units. Um, and sometimes when people say, well, why don't you just have like a small little bungalow? But in my case, I thought, you know what? Let's create space, something that people could really appreciate and enjoy and hopefully improve their way of living. So this, that was the first thing and unfortunately like most things in Lagos, you come up with a plan or a design and you go the whole nine yards and unfortunately a client will back out or decide not to go forward with it. So I'm sure like a lot of architects who are like my age probably have like an encyclopedia, well, like a whole archive of designs that they've tried to do for clients that never saw the light of day. So that never happened. But um, so that went down the tube. And I now had another project in Abuja, which I did. And it was, I don't really go too much into that particular one, but the project ended up creating the next project that I did. So one little thing that I would like you to also take from this is that it is also, it is always very good to ensure that your last project is as good as you can make it because you never know if it's gonna lead to another project. In my case, the one that I did in Abuja led to this one and like how, Clients always want something like the next day. Having a very ex uh, extensive archive allows you to bring out, this is what I've done earlier. So from that uh, project that didn't happen came this one. And this one was a project that it was using the same premise of designing one one bedroom units. And when I had my meeting with the client, he was of the opinion that this lifestyle that I'm trying to push on him doesn't make any sense. That he would rather, because I was trying to sell this one bedroom unit to him. But unfortunately, he didn't buy into it. So he insisted that we should turn that into something more extensive, which is make them into two beds and three beds, and so on and so forth. Um, one of my biggest challenges, which I'm hoping that you guys don't do, is as much as you should be passionate about your work and are very passionate about design and be very passionate about architecture, you have to think about the business side if you happen to be someone like myself that wants to do design and build. You know, because I have had so many close shaves with going almost penniless after completing the project because you try to do so much and as much as you know like i was saying to you that you can do you have to do your best on your last project because you never know what it would lead to you have to do it within reason but this project was actually a very good project for us because it now was able to allow me to take a concept that i thought was very very necessary in this environment and luckily i was able to build it and it now gave me a template to go further with. And like how we usually do stuff in our practice is that our design, because like I was saying before, the speed of how quickly you have to meet a client's requirement with a design is very, very short. So you don't necessarily have all the time in the world to 
execute the concept to the full stage. What we do in our little establishment is to improve on, review. So basically, you start with a design, you review it, the client hopefully would accept what it is that you've come up with, and then you, get to, you go to site. Um, but when you're on site, for us, is where we try and improve and review our concept or our design in order to improve you know, what it is that we're working on. And most often than not, what tends to happen is that the, 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 the initial concept or design that we take into a project always gets majorly improved upon by the time we are executing or we have executed, executed the work. I'm so sorry that I keep going. So what happens is like, you know, we still try and come up with sketches and little doodles in order to improve whatever the concept is. I mean, this is something that has actually become more effective with the whole notion of WhatsApp. I do a lot of communication with WhatsApp with my workmen in order to explain or let them understand what it is that we're trying to achieve. So um, that's what these images are meant to sort of like depict. The image that you see up there was the first, um, I guess, first iteration of what we ended up with, with the last one that I'll be showing you after this slide. Uh, I mean, I don't know if the images are very clear, but they show like some level of development that has taken place on the first um, prototype or the first concept that we did back in 2009. Sorry, there's a, a, a Swiss architect called Peter Zumthor that is uh, someone that has, obviously I haven't met him personally, but his, through his work and his books has inspired and basically you know, allowed me to sort of like express myself a little bit better in terms of what it is that I end up constructing. You know, um, I mean, he has most um, stated here that I believe that the real core of all architectural work lies in the act of construction, something that I really totally believe in. So if I take this image on the right, which was the first iteration of a concept for, um, some kind of lifestyle for young people. It has now, over time, with a lot of energy and effort, advanced to what you see back in 2017. So some kind of transformation. I mean, it's still the same basic principle or basic concept, but you can now see what it has ended up becoming with time. Um, with our work, we're very conscious of materiality. Um, I've been using this particular texture on most of the projects that I've executed. And then there's a reason for that. Basically, one of the challenges that I first encountered in this country was that when you render a wall smooth, most times it ends up either cracking or having, I mean, with the paintwork that we have here, it becomes a, a major challenge which requires a lot of maintenance and so on and so forth. So I decided over time that the best way to actually deal with that is to give your building some kind of texture. So that's why any or most projects that I've done always end up having this tyrolene. It's actually a troweled um, tyrolene finish. And another thing is that the first one that I did in Abuja, luckily it was in the villa, so there wasn't a lot of dust. So I discovered when I did the second project using the same texture that if you paint it white, it becomes a trap for, uh, for dirt, obviously during the Hammer Town period. So that led to why you see most of our projects, if anyone's familiar with our work, painted gray, because it helps to sort of like at least keep the level of maintenance uh, pretty much down. This is our process, like I was saying uh, earlier, that we're very hands-on. Um, I'm a very hands-on type architect. 
I sort of like flourish more when I'm going through the construction stage um, because what it is for rust, I mean, for example, when we were doing this, most of what we would normally become waste on a building site usually ends up being part of what we, say for example, the doors. When you're using plywood, marine plywood, for shuttering, after you've done with that, what we do is use it to make our doors. So it's the whole sort of like process of being very hands-on that enables you to take advantage of those type of things. Um, I think we've been very fortunate that the guys that we've been working with as well are very willing to learn and because I think one of the biggest problems that we have in this environment is that when it comes to the artisans, the lack of understanding, the lack of, lack of communication that architects generally don't know how to manage always tends to lead to um, bad buildings. I think that's one of our major problems here. Um, so one has to, I think, know how to have a very good understanding with the people that are helping you create these things. Um, these are more pictures of the sort of like final, I wouldn't say final because anything can still happen, but this is what, where we have managed to get to with that particular concept that was done back in 2009. And um, I feel like we have almost hit the nail on the head. There's still room for improvement. Um, but this was a very successful project. The project came along and what was interesting about this project for me was the client showed me that there is still a level of faith um, in this, in this, in this uh, country. Why I say this is that we were given almost 100% of the money to execute this building. And when someone has that level of faith in you, I think it actually helps bring out the best. Because what we ended up doing is not surprise or take our money and run like some people, I guess, would do. But we were able to really come up with something that I think is very special. Um, I'm not, yeah, I think this picture, th this particular picture is the work of one of my, my um, favorite photographers who's actually also going to be given uh, a workshop talk uh, after me, I guess. But these are pictures that we're taking, oh, well, these are not necessarily some of hers. I mean, I think these are the ones on the right are mine and the one on the left is hers. But anyway, and that's another thing about what it is that we should do as architects. We don't necessarily do much of it, is we need to sort of like start knowing that we have to build up a repertoire of what it is that we do. And that can only be done with very well taken photographs. So um, by the time you guys who are not yet architects complete, I think you have to have that at the back of your mind, that you have to sort of like put yourself out in the best light. And that's what we've tried to do. Um, another major thing is that we always like to keep things very simple um, with our work. Uh, and rather than just say, keep it simple, stupid, we say, keep it stupid, simple. So without further ado, I hope my talk has kind of like opened up a certain aspect of your, 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 your expectations about what architecture is all about. I'm talking about this to the young students. There's someone who's actually in the audience that I wanted to bring out because I feel like he has so much to offer. He's someone that I look up to and I'm going to bring him out for a reason because I, I invited him to this to this, this uh, event, and so far, he hasn't seen the reason why he has to be here. So, because you young people are the future, and I know that he has a lot to offer, because like I said, I look up to him. I'm gonna call up a guy called Koku Konu to just come and give a few words of wisdom, because back in, I mean, let's just say 20 years ago, he started a movement called the CIA, and I'm going to let him come and give you a, a bit more. I hope I'm not messing up your program here, but I just feel like because the students are here, um, I, I've only just touched on the surface of what it is that architecture is about. But I think being that this whole talk is about concept to construction, I think how we start with our concept 
is very, very important. And I'm going to bring him out now. So, Mr. Koku Konu, if you don't mind, can you please come out here and just help give... He doesn't like people clapping. So let him come out and give you some better words of wisdom about this whole movement called the architecture. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah, thanks, Ade. Um, for a start, this is a complete setup, okay? Ade simply told me to come along and listen to his chat. Now he's putting me on stage, so I know nothing about this, so I'm not responsible for anything I say or anything I do because it's not rehearsed. All right. Um, yeah, please don't clap. It's, re it's really annoying. I think we clapped about 17 times downstairs. And the guy that was hosting it, as far as I'm concerned, he, he should just stick to church programs. I mean, why are we clapping? What have we achieved? Clapping for ourselves and clapping that we're here? No, 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 no. Architecture is a much more serious thing than that. And I take it quite personally that we were asked to clap when we haven't achieved anything. It sets up wrong expectations and wrong parameters. What are, we, what are we clapping for? Okay, so leave the clapping, right. I, did, I don't know what, what I'm gonna say. I can tell you a little bit and I can tell you a lot, but I think the most important thing, and I'm just gonna keep it very short and sweet. The change that we seek starts, as that pedophile says, the man in the mirror. So, we all need to look at ourselves critically as to what it is that we have to offer. If you don't have anything to offer, then don't expect anybody to buy. If I'm offering you mediocre ideas and mediocre suggestions, then, I mean, sorry, I can't command a high price. Why do we covet things like Ferraris and Porsches and all these uh, Zlatan thing, talk about you know, and uh, what's his name, Naira Mali or Mali Naira, Caferanino Ferrari, Buganino Bugatti. You know, it's all, why do we do that? We do that because those are things that we aspire to. Okay, I don't hear anybody singing about any uh, Volkswagen, like, let's, let's, let's ride in the Volks. So, or Kumbi Boss, yeah, but they're fashionable now. All right, so in a nutshell, I'm just going to say one thing. Start with yourself and extract the best that you can do and you can always do better than you think you can do it's a proven fact i mean the the human spirit is such that the limits you don't know the limits until you reach the limit that you think is the limit then you find out you can actually go further and your breaking point is just not your point of plastic deformation it's your point of elastic reformation yeah introduce yourself and the questions please okay um, good morning, everyone. Uh, just a quick question, sir. You talked about tyrolling. Uh, I'm interested there because I've seen the finish it gives to buildings. And just like you said, I, I've also become concerned about the effects of paints and all that. Actually, one of my clients was asking me that he has kept, he has kept on renovating his building that I should tell him a finish he could use and stop all those renovations. And I know I wanted to say Tarolin, but I kept quiet because I had to go and think about it and be sure if he does it, the kind of paint it would accommodate and the process of application of the paint. So maybe you can. Do you want the second question to be asked or I should just answer this one? Okay, fine, thank you very much for that question. The thing about tyrolene was, is that um, it's a very, I mean, tyrolene has been around for, 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 for years or for, forever. Um, there are different types of tyrolene that can be done. There's the one that you can splatter on without troweling, which becomes like a, a climbing mechanism for lizards. So um, there's obviously a trick to actually avoid that, and that is to, if you're going to tyrolene your building, just leave a, a gap or a space between your, your natural ground level and where the tyrolene starts from. And another thing about tyrolene for me is that it's more of a creative addition. I'm very into texture. So it's a, like a, 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 a sort of like an addition from, from that point of view which enhances the architecture. Um, but to answer the question, the paint that I use for tyrolene that has served us very well um, aside of the fact that I was explaining earlier that I always like to use 
the color gray. I mean, the funny thing about the color gray is like I'm seeing it all over the place these days. Seems to be like doing the rounds. And I think a lot of people are catching on to the fact that it saves you a lot of money to use the right color on your building and I guess the right texture. So using acrylic paint actually helps very, very much in terms of like, you know, if you, I mean, I've done a, a Tarolin job before, which wasn't painted. Um, obviously, the, the environment here is very, very harsh, so it actually started to look somehow. But some, sometimes that could be an aesthetic that is pleasing. It's all about the state of mind, you know? It's like what is, the funny thing is that if, if everybody's doing that same thing of not painting and it becomes a fad, no one's gonna complain about it. But at the same time, to answer the question, I use an acrylic paint, but I'm very particular about the color, which is different shades of gray, because it enhances the look, and you don't have to keep painting every so often. It is rolled, it is rolled. And oh, sorry, beg your pardon. Then there's another thing. I mean, we all know that it's important to prime your walls before painting your final color. So what I do is, no matter what color I'm going to use, is I first prime with a cheap paint and then apply a very expensive acrylic paint on top. And the reason why it's good to go for a very good quality paint is that it helps reduce the number of times that you're gonna have to keep repainting your wall. So I think that's what you should advise your, your client. The interesting thing about the last couple of images that I showed you, which is that gray building, was just within the proximity of where that building is in Lecky Phase 1, Everybody has actually tyrolin their fence. I mean, tyrolin is actually quite expensive, I'm not gonna lie. But, you know, over time, I mean, that's something, that's the concept that a lot of clients don't actually have yet. They wanna go in cheap, not realizing that if you go in slightly ex more expensive, over time, you will save money. But they wanna go in cheap and then end up spending money over and over again. So um, that's what I do. So you apply a, a, a prime coat, which is usually a white, fine coat of or something similar and then I will now paint with a very good I mean the person I'm oh, sorry sorry the uh, manufacturer that I use most times for painting exterior walls is a company called Dr. Fix It they have a paint called Raincoat Raincoat is a very it's like so funny where this gray building here when people see it um, they feel like or they think that it has just recently been painted so it hasn't really aged that quickly like most other paint or colors would have. So um, I think it's also about a knack and an understanding. I think what it is as well is that we don't just look at architecture as just the building. You look at it all different aspects of it, which includes finishes. Yes, madam. So I hope that answers your question, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for the presentation, sir. It was indeed educating. My question is about the design process you showed us the other time. You said, you said um, the first stage was design, then review, then construction. I guess after construction, all we have to do is to review and then to also do handing over to the client from the explanation I have from the school. But you said the project, but your slide showed us that after construction, we had to review and then construction. It's kind of convincing. Oh, I'm so sorry. If that was what you took from that. Let me even go back to that slide, if I may. You're talking about this one. Is it this one? Yeah, yeah, this is what I showed you first. Right, so, no, what I'm trying to say about this, basically, is my design process. And I'm not saying that this is, like, the norm. Why this works for us, and why I say design review, construction, improve review, and then construction, is that most times, because of, like, the limited time that clients give you to come up with a proposal, you may not necessarily completely have your design well thought through. And how it, why it works best for us 
is that we review our design whilst we're building on site. Most times it's not necessarily the best way, but it's just because of the circumstance or the type of situation that we find ourselves in, that we find ourselves in. I mean, it might not necessarily be always the case because sometimes the client might give you all the time that you need to formalize and finalize your design, have it completely signed off before you now send it out to tender and get a contractor to build it. And you know, if you were to go through that, that um, method of, um, um, that procurement method, the unfortunate thing is that if you have to make any change or any review, it is most likely going to end up costing the client because the contractor on site is going to charge for variation. But for us, because of the, you know, because we're more like, like Francis, I've actually worked with Francis quite a number of times. It's like this whole process of making. Instead of making something small like Francis does, we actually make buildings. But in order to get it right, it has to be reviewed. And most times, part of that uh, review is down to cost. I'm thinking to myself, if I were to change this or spin this around a little bit, in as much as it's going to be a very beautiful end result, sure, I mean, I'm certain about that because we are very good at what we do. However, it might end up costing us a lot of money. So we have to review that, is it worth it? Do you understand what I'm saying? But that's what this whole design process is about for us. Um, I, I guess if you're thinking of being uh, an architect builder, it might be a process that you may adopt. But if you obviously don't want to run into major expenses or overruns or high budgets or whatever, not budgets, no, but anyway, that's basically what it is for us. That's our design process. Some people also have adopted it, and some people feel like it's like the worst thing ever because control, it doesn't allow you to control cost. My question is not to you. My question is to him. He's not here, Mr. Koku Konu. Mr. Mr. Koku Konu. Um, so you were saying something about students reading books and basically in school we, we don't get to know about the fusing or the collaboration between architecture and art. So I want, I, I, my question is how do, how do we create that critical thinking between the art student and the architecture student, like the collaboration between them and how we can work with locally implemented material? Thank you. Thanks. I think that's, that's a very, very valid question that she's raised. She's touched about two things. She's talked about the, unit, um, the relationship between art and architecture. Now, there's a friend of mine who says architecture breaks down to art is a technical chore. That's how you get architecture. I don't know if it's true or not. That's one of his clever things he says. I think he thought about himself when he was in the toilet because it doesn't make sense to me. How can art be a technical chore? Translates to architecture. Anyway, that's his own idea. So. What, what I'm trying to say is that there is a very strong basis. And architects originally were artists. You go back, you go back. Actually, they came from stonemasons because they were the most important people when they were building cathedrals and big buildings. But then art came into it. And in the Renaissance, you had great guys. Leonardo, anybody know anybody in the Renaissance? I'll give you a clue. They're all from Ninja Turtles. Anybody? Raphael, another person, Michelangelo, another person, Donatello, yeah, great, you see? Ninja Turtles, all Renaissance, big boys. They all had interest in art, architecture, math, science, anatomy, it's all the same thing. Architecture is the encompassing uh, profession of all creatives. How do you get the fusion between art and architecture? It's very personal. Again, is the concept is anything that you think or you see that you like that gives you a buzz. It could be, I'm sorry, the shape of a woman. It could be this paper. It could be an idea you have. Oh, would it be great if apples were not called apples but were called bananas? So let me make an apple nana. You know, you can have any concept you like. The concept is totally determined by you. It's not determined by building. And one of the things that we try to teach students, this is 20 years ago, and we're going to try and do it again, is that there's no idea that's rubbish or that's not valid. That's not true. Every idea is valid. It's just how you interpret it and how you put it across. 
I hope that answers your question.